you all for coming to today's speech with Dina Esposito, who is the Vice President of Technical Leadership at Mercy Corps. Um, and she's also a SICE alum, correct? Yeah. yeah. So I'm always really excited when we have SICE alum come um, to be able to speak and kind of give a little bit back to the community. Um, but today's talk is going to be focused on um, her experience with Mercy Corps and also USAID. And she'll be discussing global food security trends and evolving policies and practice with regards to food security and food assistance in fragile and conflict affected, affected settings. She will give particular focus to food aid reform, the rise and evolution of cash transfer programming, and resilience as a concept and program approach to address chronic poverty and reluctant shocks or recurrent shocks in fragile, fragile contexts. So I won't keep you waiting much longer. Um, if you join me in welcoming Ms. Dina Esposito. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for inviting me and to Melanie, who, uh, excuse me, to our intern, Michelle, sorry, I'm blanking, uh, who invited me also um, to speak with you. I think this is my first time speaking at SICE since in ever, and I graduated uh, long, ago, long ago, but delighted to be back and delighted to see that there's actually an international development program. When I was here, uh, I majored in US foreign policy in Africa. There was no development program. It started the year, I think I graduated, Grace started the social change and development portfolio. So things have changed a lot. Um, I'm speaking from a practitioner's perspective. Um, I have a long career in the US government. I was a presidential management fellow after SICE, joining the Refugee Bureau at the State Department before jumping over to the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. Uh, where I had a very formative experience being the response manager for the Somalia famine of 91-92, which really set me on my current trajectory. I got very interested in how do you address the underlying causes of some of these uh, crises that generate mass displacement and human suffering, got into the peace building and governance world, went abroad with an NGO to Ethiopia and Kenya before coming back to be a political appointee in the Obama administration. I was the director in the Office of Food for Peace, and I'll say a word about that in a minute. I was there for about six years. Um, I want to recognize that in addition to the students, we do have somebody here from USAID, from the Bureau for Resilience. I'm going to be talking uh, about resilience in a minute, uh, so I'll be welcoming her, her comments. So in terms of the topics for today, I wasn't really sure how much orientation you have to food assistance and food security trends in general. So I just wanted to start with some overview slides. Then I'm going to get into food aid reform and cash-based food assistance. We'll go into looking beyond cash, making markets work in crisis, which is a Mercy Corps approach, and then resilience evolving policy and practice. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't start by talking about Mercy Corps. Uh, you heard that I'm the Vice President for Technical Leadership. That is a fancy way of saying that I lead the subject matter experts, 50 or 60 people with specialties in very specific sectors who go out and provide technical support to our fields and also inform all of our, our approach documents. But Mercy Corps is a global organization. It's mission to alleviate suffering, poverty, and injustice. And one of the things that drew me to, to Mercy Corps, I've been here about a year and a half, is the fact that it works in emergency work and development work, driving a lot of development solutions towards the emergency agenda. And it marries relief and development with peace building. I find it. Um, extremely encouraging that there are some organizations who are comfortable speaking across these very different sectors, a very different language. I think that all of them are interrelated and vital if we're going to be working in fragile contexts. Mercy Corps is working in around 40 countries. The vast majority of our staff are from the countries where we work. Some of the places where we have our largest programs include Yemen, Iraq, Syria, South Sudan, Somalia, Northeast Nigeria and the Sahel, including Mali and Niger. So Mercy Corps approaches are informing my work today, as is uh, the Office of Food for Peace experience that I had. <clears throat> I mentioned I was there for about six years. And um, it is also, like Mercy Corps, an, uh, an organization that is comfortable working in emergency and development. As far as I know, it's the only office of AID at least when I was there, that was comfortable and actually worked simultaneously in both spaces. Emergency programs for food assistance obviously focused on saving lives, reducing suffering, and supporting early recovery. 
But the development programs were focused on addressing the root causes of that food insecurity in highly fragile contexts that might otherwise require food assistance. And so that's very relevant for our later conversation because Food for Peace has a, had a very unique vantage point that really informed my thinking in the sense that it drove development dollars to marginalized areas that most development actors had absolutely no interest in working in because the return on investment from a purely production standpoint is low. But if you think about that return on investment from humanitarian needs averted, then you get a very different equation. So uh, Food for Peace was a vital part of the agenda of growing resilience as a, as a, as a policy and as an approach. So just quickly, the pillars of food security. I hope uh, some of you might be familiar with this, but this is the way we practitioners think about it. Is food available in sufficient quantities, whether it be homegrown, locally grown, or imported? Is food accessible? Do people have the means to acquire it regularly in adequate uh, quantities and in a sufficient diversity? And again, whether it be through purchase, production, or other means. Is it utilized well at the household level, such that it has a positive nutritional impact? This refers to storage, hygiene, cooking, and sharing practices. Access to clean water comes into play in a big way when we talk about food utilization. And the fourth pillar has to do with stability, and it refers to the fact that all three need to be maintained on a consistent basis to have food security. I would just mention here, too, that when we think about famines, there's a, often a misconception that the problem, the food security problem, is about availability. When, in fact, in, I think, most famine situations, there is food. It's just that there's not enough food and, mostly, that there are communities who are not able to access it for a variety of reasons. It may be that they're marginalized. There may be political reasons. There may be violence. Uh, when economies are collapsed, like in Yemen, people simply don't have the money to buy it. But it isn't uh, a lack of, a complete lack of food. It's not a production problem. It's an access problem. Um, the last thing to say about food security today is that it goes hand in hand with a conversation about nutrition. It is about the sufficient, um, sustained access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. We talk more and more about nourishing the world, not so much about feeding the world. It has to do with the recognition that micronutrient deficiencies um, cause um, uh, dramatic uh, problems vis-a-vis -vis cognitive growth and, and physical growth in children. This is something we refer to as stunting, which permanently impair, impairs not only physical growth, but also um, the ability to learn, which has knock-on effects for entire nations. So the bank estimates that stunting can bring lost productivity ranging up to 11% of GDP in some Asian and African countries. So nutrition figures hugely in uh, our approaches as well as in the approaches of AID. So you may, I don't know, maybe the news cycle, you're, there's at least some news breaking through about some of the bad news stories in global hunger. I hope some of you are familiar with that. But maybe start uh, by showing you a good news trend, at least until recent years. The last 20 years, you've seen dramatic declines in global hunger. This has to do with the fact that we grow more food than ever before, more nutritious food than ever before, enough to feed everyone on the planet if it were distributed properly. Um, and we know that incomes are rising, which uh, is uh, allowing people to access more food. Extreme poverty, the number of people living on less than $1.25 a day, halved between 1991 and 2015. And that's where you're seeing huge improvements vis-a-vis -vis global hunger. The problem comes at the end of this line between 2014 and 2016. You have, for the first time in a couple decades, a reversal in global hunger trends, and we're going to talk about why in a minute. Another uh, thing to say is just that uh, in terms of good news, death tolls from famines over the last 150 years have dropped dramatically. Uh, this is due both to the production and reduction in poverty, things that I've mentioned to you before, but also has to relate to a much more sophisticated early warning system on the emergency response side. We know much earlier, we plan much farther in advance, we're able to mitigate the impacts of food shocks. 
much more sophisticated and professionalized humanitarian response community that's emerged over the recent decades. And we have the development of specialized foods that can be administered at home that do not require refrigeration and can literally bring a child back from the brink of death. It's, it's really quite a miraculous food. And with that came the expansion of community-managed acute malnutrition programs. So even when you have a malnourished child, the mortality rates from famine are actually much, much lower than they used to be. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't note that we have had some famines in recent years. Anybody know? Yemen, not officially declared, but on the verge and has been for many years. Anybody else? 2011, Somalia, we actually have uh, the data there, which tells us that roughly a quarter of a million people died. It went almost no, unnoticed globally, which is tragic for those of us who, who focus on these things for, for a living. South Sudan, also declared in 2017. Um, so we turn now to the, the, the current story, which is about food emergencies around the world. And this slide is showing populations who are acutely food insecure, or those whose lives or livelihoods are both are going to be threatened, absent some sort of uh, support. And this is a subset of the much larger numbers. But you can see this is a slide from the Famine Early Warning System Network, or FuseNet. They're projecting somewhere around 85 million people across 46 countries in need of emergency food assistance. The thing that I find most shocking about this slide is, well, two things. One, 80% rise in the numbers of hungry people since 2015. And when I began as Food for Peace director, it was, I would say, this number is at least two times what it was just a decade ago. Um, and then, of course, you see the famine threatens South Sudan, Yemen, and Northeast Nigeria. I think uh, the fact that people are at threat of starvation in 2019 should be a crime, <laughs> and uh, that it should be better, better understood and better noted. Uh, there's just not a lot of attention uh, in the media these days to a lot of, a lot of this. I don't think the, the bubbles on the chart are surprise you. The largest ones show you the largest emergencies, Yemen. South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and so on are, are noted there. Why, why is that number so much higher than it used to be? Two thirds of all the food insecure in the world are in conflict affected places, and so it correlates with these record levels of displacement, which I hope you're aware of. 68.5 million people displaced, more than at any time since there have been record keeping on this, more than World War I, more than World War II. Majority are displaced internally, but refugee populations, enormous, 25 million people. Three countries are generating the vast majority of those, Syria, South Sudan, and Afghanistan. The FAO, however, for the first time noted last year that uh, climate variability and weather extremes are the second key driver behind the rise in global hunger. So we've been waiting for that to come around, but it was the first report where they actually acknowledged it forthright or forthrightly, not just as a sort of uh, exacerbating factor, but something very central to the problem. And they argue that it is negatively affecting all four dimensions of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability. So that's the back story. On to the United States. The U.S. has been reinvesting in global food security for the last three administrations. Uh, that's a good news story. I think um, also a lot of attention to reforming food aid, which we'll dive into a little bit more. But from the global food security perspective, the Bush administration uh, stood up and took notice along with the rest of the world with, when we had a global food price crisis in 2007-2008. That was a global call to action with the G7, G8, and developing nations all committing to reinvesting in agricultural-led growth and nutrition. And that translated, uh, when we went from President Bush to President Obama's administration, into something called the Feed the Future initiative. I don't know how, if any of you heard of Feed the Future. Is that common? OK. All right. So I won't say too much about it. But whole of government approach, heavily invested in data collection and monitoring and evaluation, 
which has borne fruit in terms of people's interest in committing to the agenda. They are able to point to lifting more than 23 million people out of poverty. Congress has uh, supported this agenda on a bipartisan basis. We had the Global Food Security of Act of 2015, which was a very triumphant moment for us, getting global food security enshrined into law well beyond the administration. And that Global Food Security Act was reauthorized in 2018, signed by the White House. So we do have a sustained uh, interest. I mentioned the 2014 and 2018 farm bills because we're going to talk about food aid reform next. And the Office of Food for Peace that I worked in is named after the Food for Peace Act, which is part of the Farm Bill. And it is the oversight committee for the Farm Bill and the Food for Peace Act and International Food Assistance are the agriculture committees, uh, very different from the foreign affairs committees. And that has a lot to do with the story of food aid reform. So does anybody know what food aid reform refers to in just general terms? Why we like to talk about it? Cinnamon. Sourcing locally, that's right. It's about untying American food aid from American food, right? The legislation was originally written in 1954 when there was a lot of PL 480, a lot of surplus disposal that we shipped overseas uh, for our own interests as well as those who needed it. And now, actually, food became very expensive. Surplus was no longer the case. And Food for Peace began buying on the commercial market like everybody else at commercial prices and buying what our partners overseas asked for. So it is no longer a surplus disposal program. And if you can remember one thing, I would love it if you could <laughs> remind people that it is no longer a surplus disposal program. But um, the problems with having tied American food aid were numerous. At least that was our feeling uh, in the Bush, in the, well, the Bush administration also pushed for this. Uh, Andrew Natsios as the head of AID, and then uh, Raj Shah. But it was costly to ship American food. It got very expensive. Food prices went up. Fuel prices went up. The idea of untying it from American food meant that we could serve more people and serve them probably faster because the food was being procured locally. Um, the in-kind food basket was also very limited, right? We had grains, we had oil, and we had some pulses. The dietary diversity issue, the nutrition issue, is like, wait a minute, is then we need a little bit more going on here. If we can buy locally, people can have access to fruits, vegetables, protein, meat. Um, so there was an argument around nutrition. And then, of course, the age-old argument had to do with the fact with what happens to local markets when you bring on a bunch of food, right? Especially if it's year in and year out, year in and year out, you end up um, there's the potential anyway, if you don't do it properly, you don't do your, your uh, analysis right, that the bottom of, for food prices bottoms out, farmers start, local farmers start growing, and you, you have just a whole bunch of not negative knock-on effects that actually makes people less um, resilient, if I can use that word, because they, they're not using the, the tools at their disposal locally to cope and adapt to their, their situation. So those were all uh, some of the reasons that we talked about untying food aid. And it wasn't just to buy locally and regionally, but increasingly there was a growing trend called camp cash transfer programming. This isn't so much about buying the food to buy from a farmer and bringing it to somebody. It's about giving somebody cash or a voucher and saying, you are a disaster survivor. What do you need? You, the, the power is in your hands. Go to the market. Decide what it is you need. Cash transfer programming now figures very prominently, has been a major disruptor in the humanitarian space. So what happened in the, Obama, in the Bush years, uh, begun under Bush and then in o Obama? Um, the first thing that the administration tried to do was zero out the Title II PL 480 account. They just sent a big zero up to Congress, said, we don't want any more Tide aid. We're going to put it all in the foreign affairs account. Well, you can imagine that did not go over well at all. Created a very rough uh, conversation. And as our oversight committee, when I was in Food for Peace, I can tell you it was, it was a challenging time. And then we ended up then pivoting to another conversation, was like, if we can't move all the money out, let's 
create more flexibility in, in the Farm Bill itself. And so we proposed two key things. One was to end monetization, which I won't spend a lot of time on now. It's a very interesting topic in and of itself, but it basically involves buying a bunch of food in the US, shipping it abroad, not to feed people, but to sell, to get money, to do development. That was figuring very largely in the old Farm Bill. And then the second thing was what we've talked about. Can we buy food locally and regionally closer to disasters, or can we do cash transfers or food vouchers to disaster survivors? So that we got a little bit more traction on. And so two things basically happened. Um, and I have this question here, do we have food aid reform? I think this is a very interesting question because there are still people who argue that since we didn't zero out the Farm Bill, we don't have it. Whereas when I look at the picture today, I see a glass half full. Um, we know that these are Food for Peace numbers. When we started in 2010, 86% of the account was tied to American food. In 2015, 52% of the account was tied to American food, and today it's 60 to 65% of the account is um, now for cash. So we, we've got actually more cash programming than food for two reasons. One, the Farm Bill, the Ag Committees did relent. They gave us some cash within the account. They untied a portion of the aid. And the second thing that happened was that the food, uh, the um, Foreign Affairs Committees got fed up with the Ag Committees and said, you don't want to do it. We're going to authorize it ourselves. And in the Global Food Security Act of 2015, Senator Corker refused to sign the law until it incorporated the Emergency Food Security Program, which was 100% cash for aid to do with it as it worked. Section, section 7 was a major victory. Nobody else noticed, but Food for Peace was, was cheering. And that was reauthorized uh, in the 2018 bill as well. Not only is it authorized, but when I started in 2010, there were $300 million for cash-based programming. Food for Peace last year had $1.8 billion for cash-based food assistance, which is larger than the tied aid account. So you could probably run this argument either way, but I, I'm pretty happy with kind of where this thing has, has, uh, has gone. So a word about Mercy Corps cash-based food assistance program. We don't do a lot of local regional procurement, but we had the first example here of our decision to buy wheat flour in, uh, in Turkey to bring into Syria is an example. This did not go to individuals. It went to uh, bakeries, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that case when we talk about looking beyond cash. Um, Yemen is an example of uh, a program where we're working on vouchers to feed hungry people. This is a picture from Yemen. You've got somebody here who's looking at a paper voucher. This is becoming a thing of the past. Increasingly, you're seeing more and more sophisticated efforts to use systems that are less prone to fraud. So you've got transfers that are made by mobile phone. You've got uh, debit cards, just like you have. Uh, and those debit cards uh, are, and those transfers are linked to what we call biometrics at point of sale. So in, I just visited Northeast Nigeria, I was in a deep field site. The vendor has a little machine where people put their fingerprint. They can determine that that person is the person who's supposed to get the food. In Jordan, the UN is using iris scans in the grocery stores. So a refugee can come up have an iris scan. I can't quite imagine that, but uh, and then they're you know they're eligible to to get their their assistance. Um, for our for Mercy Corps, our cash transfer programming has gone from 24 percent to 50 percent of all our humanitarian aid over the last three years, and this is very much aligning with our in the industry trends and the high levels of commitments at the international level at the World Humanitarian Summit to prioritize. Um, cash over in-kind goods wherever possible. Uh, we're actively involved in cash transfer programming in 13 countries, ranging from active conflict to recovery, and we've distributed more than $72 million in cash transfers to disaster-affected populations. So I mentioned that cash is the biggest disruptor. 
Mercy Corps' team is now saying, look, we need to look beyond cash. We need to think about moving out of the demand side over to the supply side. These are protracted crises. We need to stop just focusing on one area. And we have put out a paper with this very title, Beyond Cash, Making Markets Work in Prices. And we're looking the, at this tool here as a bit of a, a model for what we're thinking about. Um, cash transfer programming to individuals still falls within the bottom left quadrant, right? We're still on basic quote, uh, coping to individuals and households. We are now testing approaches that harness local systems to better help people cope. That would be moving to the right. And that's an example of the bakery program I mentioned in, and I'll talk about again in a second. And we're also working now to get folks to the, um, or to get, uh, to improve and expand market systems themselves. So again, trying to always push from the direct support over to the market support is the way we are thinking about our program approach now. With regard to improving local systems, this is a tough go in conflict settings, as you can imagine. Sometimes you are very limited to these bottom two quadrants. But I do think uh, in our paper, if you're interested, there's a super interesting case study from northern Uganda. Very thin markets in northern Uganda, but you have a huge influx of refugees and a ready population with land and who are settled there. We have provided loan guarantees to seed suppliers in Kampala, connected them with retailers up in these areas, and then providing them with the support to offer discounts to draw in refugees and host communities and to establish a relationship between the vendors and the communities, basically trying to grow the market. We're not giving the beneficiary a voucher to go buy those seeds. We're helping the vendor say, these are your customers. We can help you design a discount program to draw them in. But you don't see Mercy Corps' name anywhere uh, in that system. So that's an example of the kind of work we're trying to push when we talk about looking beyond cash. Um, why do we have the courage to talk about some of this stuff? We've done a lot of research uh, in Syria, in Nigeria, and other places about how people cope and adapt. We know that even in protracted crisis, markets rarely collapse entirely. People find new ways to procure, exchange, and consume. And we just have to keep saying that. It's very basic. But when you get into a humanitarian mindset, it's, it's hard to remind people sometimes that this is the reality. They rely considerably more, our research shows, on markets than they do on humanitarian aid or than they do on local government. That has come through very clearly. So in our view, this limited reach of aid and the protracted nature of crises together are bringing new energy to this conversation. And our full report is calling on policymakers and practitioners to blend relief and development programs rather than making these artificial distinctions, well, it's emergency, therefore we can only do relief and we can only do relief in a certain way, is just not very helpful. And we're asking for folks to think about shifting program directions much quicker. We know that the evidence suggests that these protracted displacements are, in fact, protracted. So don't wait till year nine. And we're in Nigeria now, year nine of that crisis, before we start having this, this conversation. I won't go spend a lot of time, but basically, again, how can we help people solve these problems? That's what a traditional humanitarian would say versus how can we work with market actors to make the market system work better? So the Syria example is really just, uh, again, saying, look, instead of giving food directly to people, we brought flour to bakeries. Those partner bakeries, the market was able to stay open. There were relationships that continued this um, kind of abstract idea of social, social cohesion um, that we're trying to help sustain and build net social networks in times of crisis. And just sheer scale, 100,000 people a day. You can't do that with direct delivery. And we, this prices were stabilized in the areas that we worked. So that's a little bit about cash transfer, uh, about looking beyond cash. And the last topic I wanted to cover has to do with this idea of resilience, which um, I would say that markets in crisis is a subset of that conversation, which is more complex and more elaborate. So far, the resilience work we've been doing and looking at is multi-year development programs in more stable places. 
uh, not super stable, but stabler, a northern Uganda, but in the Karamoja region, which is not uh, where the refugees are. Uh, the DRC, again, not in the most volatile areas. Uh, Ethiopia is another example, and, and Nepal. Um, this is our definition of resilience. It is, there are a lot of different ones, and they're pretty complex, but fundamentally, it's about the ability to manage adversity and change without compromising future well-being. The ability to manage adversity and change, adversity and change without compromising future well-being. It has a systems-oriented approach. It blends the market concepts with social and ecological systems approaches, and it figures, shocks and stresses figure prominently. So in a traditional uh, development program, they tend to be quite linear. Uh, you prioritize a range of investments, and after a certain period of time, you're going to get an improved outcome. That's the left side. We are increasingly forced to reckon with the fact that reality looks a lot more like the graph on the right, where shocks and stresses are repeatedly reversing gains. So when we conceptualize resilience, it's about lessening the impact of those shocks and stresses so that the setbacks are not as large and recovery is quicker. So um, these, uh, why, why do we have resilience? Treating sh current shocks like drought as acute emergencies is costly and unsustainable. This was acutely clear to us in AID, especially after the 2011-2012 drought. Um, the cost to affected nations. During that period, Kenya alone lost $12 billion, mostly in the livestock sector. The ability to manage that number or, or come up with a number to look at the uh, development losses from these is, was really important in trying to make the case for why we needed to invest in these marginalized areas. Uh, it was, it's obviously costly to people. I mentioned already more than a quarter million lives lost in Somalia, millions of livelihoods disrupted across the regions. This drought in 2011 affected the Horn badly, especially Ethiopia, Kenya, but uh, we had also the very next year a huge drought in the Sahelian countries. Uh, 2012, with uh, great effort, we managed to reduce loss of, mitigate uh, loss of life. But then, of course, we know this costly response to the United States, 1.5 billion for drought in just those two years alone. I think, though, the thing that really got this agenda traction was the fact that host country, the, the countries that were affected by these crises were like, we, we can't do this anymore. We are going to, we want to have a new agenda that focuses on this issue. And they set the strategy. So ending drought emergency strategy by the government of Kenya, the establishment of the drought management authority in the government of Kenya meant that all the donors, not just the US, were able to back a government-led agenda and really move money simultaneously up into the arid lands. I'm sure our Center for Resilience person could tell us about some of the impressive results in terms of reduction in depth of poverty and averted humanitarian need in the last couple of years because of that investment. Um, another uh, example of the investments that AID and others are making to make the case, um, complex calculations going into this kind of work, but roughly saying if we get in there earlier and avert the crisis, we can save for every dollar or three and reduce humanitarian aid and avoided losses. So how is this different from just good development? We're going to focus on people and places subject to recurrent crises. These are not perpetual humanitarian risks. They're entirely predictable and can be addressed with development. We're going to explicitly recognize that these are perennial features, droughts and floods, not anomalies. When I was uh, in the 90s in AID, working in the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, major drought in Kenya, Somalia, Somalia famine, the mission director in Kenya told me, you emergency people, get up there and take care of that problem. You're distracting me. I've got, you know, I'm in the Rift Valley trying to grow food, and I can't pay attention with this stuff going on up there. So um, let's see if I can get back here. Um, so that's, that's changed a lot. And then uh, bringing humanitarian and development professionals together, again, needing uh, multiple skill sets, 
aim for collective impact, not just project outcomes, and start by building on risk management and resilience capacities of households. So the one thing I would also just want to flag here is this focus on capacities. Humanitarians tend to focus on vulnerabilities, right? And there's something incredibly different uh, and opening up of the conversation, especially when you're talking to country, to nations, to say, you are a resilient country, we want to build your capacities to be more resilient, than to come in and say, you are very fragile, and you are very vulnerable, and we're here to, you know, to help you. So there's something remarkably different about the nature of the, what's going on, I think, in the resilience conversation, and which is why I'm very excited about it. Uh, Mercy Corps has become a thought leader with AID on this issue of resilience. We've de developed something called the Strategic Risk and Resilience Assessment Tool. We've used it in eight or nine places now around the world. Most of them are, are not protracted crisis, uh, conflicts, um, but we're starting to get there. These are the basic questions, you know. What is your long-term development goal? What shocks and stresses threaten those goals? What groups and subgroups are we targeting? What systems currently shape or affect them? And what capacities will help these subgroups cope and adapt? This is just another way to think about it, more um, in a sort of flow chart uh, agenda. And I just have two examples of how we're thinking differently through a resilience frame. This is a program that's funded by the Office of Food for Peace, implemented by Mercy Corps in Nepal. And it is a multi-year, five-year food security program. And I don't want to go so much into the details of the results, but just to say that we're not only looking at the results, which you see on the upper you know, green and gray slide, that's the food security outcomes. But in the lower portion of the slide, what you're seeing is that we have um, also are now reporting on shocks, right? We've established shock monitoring systems to measure the impact of certain shocks so we can say that we achieved these food security outcomes even though 50% of households regularly report facing shocks and stresses, only 5% use negative coping strategies, and large numbers of the folks participating are now using climate information systems, financial services, and land management tech techniques to better manage risk. So it's about doing business differently, but you also have to measure differently, right, if you're going to make the case. And so that's one of the things we've been spending a lot of time at is, is how do we measure the impact of this approach? Because otherwise it does look an awful lot like traditional development, right? You, you've got to be very intentional about explaining what, what's different. Ethiopia Prime is a project that's finishing up now. It's a Mercy Corps program focused on pastoral communities in the arid and semi-arid lands of, of Ethiopia. Its program was in five key areas, livestock productivity and competitiveness, natural resource management and climate adaptation, human nutrition, alternative livelihoods outside of the pastoral livelihood, um, and financial access, access to finance, knowledge and learning management, not just for ourselves, but for the communities that we're working in. So this program reached more than two million, almost two million people, and the independent evaluation of it, done by Feed the Future, reported to Congress that, um, that uh, let me see if I find it here, that um, households that were part of this program preserved their food security status in the worst drought in 60 years, while others fell by 30 percent. Sorry. Last two slides. So the, um, we have some good evidence about what's working with regard to weather-related shocks, and there's a lot of momentum in that area. But increasingly now, if you look at uh, the UN reports, if you look at the World Bank's reports on fragility and conflict, uh, if you talk to donors, not just the US, but the, the Brits and the European Union and the French and others, they're saying, wait a minute, we need to apply these ideas in protracted conflict settings. And why are they saying that? Well, if you're interested in ending extreme poverty, you need to go to protracted conflicts because somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of all the extreme poor will be in these protracted conflict settings sometime around 2030. So there's an urgency now from the development side of the house to say, oh my gosh, we've got to figure out how to deal with protracted conflict. 
We also already know, as I mentioned, that the vast majority of food insecure populations are in conflict areas. So if you care about food, global food security, global hunger, you're going to have to figure this out. Now, I have really mixed feelings about this topic, to be honest. We are very careful at Mercy Corps to say that political will to end conflict is what is needed first and foremost, not the resilience to live in them, right? I mean, it feels a little bit like admitting defeat. Like, yeah, we can't figure it out on the diplomatic flood. You development people, you relief people, you go in and figure out how to make everyone resilient because we're not going to solve these conflicts anytime soon. Um, I recognize, though, that the reality is the reality, and we should be thinking and applying these kinds of uh, systemic approaches, uh, and we're, we're game to, to give it a try. So we have taken our stress analytical tool to Northeast Nigeria and to the DRC um, and, we ha and to Somalia, and we know that there are relevant components, right? We know that markets work in many of these places and more private sector can be engaged, but we also are modifying our concept of resilience to think differently about why it, it needs to look different in these conflict settings. Peace building, uh, and again, because Mercy Corps comes from three optics, is very comfortable with saying, yeah, we need to elevate peace building now as the central or a central dimension alongside our market systems work if we're going to do anything and get anything done, right? And that that peace building needs to be thought of in three ways. Conflict sensitive humanitarian action, understanding that the way you deliver aid can divide or connect people. So humanitarians, just the way you deliver your aid should be conflict sensitive. We can do mitigation and management at a certain point, which is really recognizing that when, when people move and you have disruptions of populations, you need to actively manage new conflicts that are emerging in the midst of these crises. So conflict mitigation and management. And then fundamentally, we can begin in certain contexts to address the root causes of conflict by looking at ecological issues, damage to the environment. Governance with a small g, I would say, you know, we are increasingly focusing on are there bright spots of local governance in these settings? We, you know, often the national level, we're not going to have the national level leadership we have in a Kenya or in an Ethiopia. That part, I think, is also really tricky. Uh, this is sort of the conceptual framework as far as we've gotten it. You're seeing it first. We have not put this out anywhere. But uh, what you can see is that the outcomes we seek are not just about prosperity, but we've elevate, elevated peace and the urgency of food and water security for displaced uh, alongside economic growth as the priorities for building resilience in protracted settings. We have peace building figuring just as largely as systemic approaches. They have to go hand in hand. And we have these three circles that show that you can do different things depending on the context and that you're likely to have to move back and forth between the circles, right? If it's really hot conflict, you're coping, coping, coping and adapting in a conflict sensitive delivery of assistance. But then you can, there are opportunities as the environment changes to do these other things. But recognizing you need to have some flexibility to move back and forth. This kind of approach needs to be um, grounded in better analytics. If you're going to be in a conflict setting for a decade, I think the investment in analytics for the humanitarians are static. We need really much more dynamic uh, analytics to understand that the conflict, how it's changing, and how we need to change with it. And we need the donors to um, give us some leeway on the practitioner side by loosening up, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but changing their procurement processes and their expectations. It's all very static now. You get a two-year award, a three-year award, and you do the same thing. It's just not, not the way, it's not reflecting the reality of the situation on the ground. So that's, um, that's where we're at. Um, I covered a huge amount of material, all the way from just basic trends, food aid reform, beyond cash within a kind of emergency setting, resilience in two settings, right? First, the more stable settings where we're looking at weather and climate related shocks. And now we're moving into this new dimension uh, this is something much discussed at the bank this week at the World Bank meetings. We'll be hosting a panel on this uh, and in many, other, in many other fora. So I finish with that, and I take your questions.
So thank you so much. Um, my name is Maya Gaynor. I'm a second year uh, student in international development. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about um, increasing access to nutritious food, um, especially in emergency settings where on the humanitarian side often that hasn't historically been right. the type of food that people are getting. Yeah, so in Syria, uh, I was in Turkey when I was at Food for Peace looking uh, at the food assistance portfolio for Syrian refugees in Turkey. Now, Turkey is a very well-developed economy, as you can imagine. So for me, it was the first time I saw this kind of uh, use of a deb uh, debit card, if you will, to go into a grocery store, as opposed to where I've spent most of my career in Africa, watching he people queue up in line you know, for hours in the hot sun, right? And I went with a Syrian refugee woman to the grocery store. And we went through. And now they have a more naturally diverse diet than some of our, say, uh, friends in Niger or places that tend to be, or Malawi, that tend to focus almost solely on grains. But she was picking out her dairy and her, her fresh fruits and vegetables and saying, you know, this store is close to the refugee camp. I can get up every day and go pick food for that, my household. That is familiar to me. And as bad as it is here, this is something that at least makes me, gives me some sense of normalcy that I can do this. And so she was naturally choosing, I would say, very, very healthful foods. In a place like Niger, uh, where people will focus almost exclusively on grains, no matter what you do, they just go to the store, they buy the same thing. They want the grains. It's much more of a challenge, and it does involve behavior change, communication, and conversation about what, what kinds of foods can be prepared. So difficult, depending on the context, to move the needle on dietary diversity and nutrition, it just very much depends on, on the, the tradition and culture that you're, you're faced with. Um, um, there was another, in uh, the other challenge that I think we're facing in Nigeria, where I just came back from, is that uh, those food transfers are only happening once a month, and nobody wants to spend it on perishable foods. So we're thinking about how do we combine uh, gardening around refugee tents and things like this, where people can grow at least enough fresh vegetables and they can continue to get the, the dried foods, the dried grains and whatnot. So different challenges in each context. And so I'm trying to write my capstone. Well, so originally I went to write a paper on food insecurity and thought that it would be an obvious sort of link that, com or that food insecurity and water insecurity can cause conflict mm -hmm. and found that in academics and in scholarship it's not there and it's not defined. So now I'm trying to write my capstone about if it is a cause and saying that it is ca like direct causation and mm -hmm. conflict. So I'm just sort of wondering at Mercy Corps in the US government, how comfortable are people saying that? Yeah. Are they still backing away from that, or is it something that people are warming yeah. up to? Well, I think people are comfortable saying that people fight over natural resources. So if you go to the arid lands of Kenya or parts of uh, Somalia, you can show upticks in violence in, when there are fewer watering points. So natural resource, I think conflict over natural resources, people are very comfortable. I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an evidence base there. The question is whether climate change is causing uh, more conflict. And that's where the, the literature is dicey, right? And maybe that's what you're referring to. Um, we are increasingly um, elevating climate change as an issue. We have already, from our point, what we can contribute is to simply say that we are helping people adapt to a changing climate. And that's absolutely, we're not at the point, there's other organizations focusing on reducing climate change the, by reducing emissions. We are saying well, what our job is now is to recognize that these are fundamentally changed landscapes and that we will help people adapt to those, to those crises and, and to, re, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question completely, but a lot, we're putting out, I think, four papers one overarching paper and three case studies on the relationship between conflict and climate. And that's because our team was grappling with this exact question. So you've really hit upon something, yeah. I'm 
thank you. <laughs> I just feel awkward. Um, Melina, uh, thank you so much for uh, presenting about this. I'm very interested in food security. It's really it's a cool subject for me. So I'm just wondering if, you know, a lot of programs talk about access to food. They never mm -hmm. talk about the supply chain process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the supply chain is actually the issue in a lot of countries. So I'm just wondering if during your career you've seen any challenges in the supply chain and what you did to basically fix it. Mm. Um, I mean, the supply chain for food aid is very different than a commercial supply chain, I think. Uh, so I won't talk about that because I don't think they're talking about that sort of problem, which we managed a lot of. Um, but in a case like South Sudan, where clearly the markets are empty in the most conflict affected places, there's, there's no question about that. In Yemen as well, you wanted, we wanted to work on the demand side by giving people choice, but we also don't want to create inflation, right? So um, a lot of what happens is it involves uh, identifying who the local traders are and what their barriers are to moving food to that place and working through those issues. Often traders, remarkably, I found this in Northeast Nigeria, are all in these places which people say are too insecure to bring food aid. <laughs> they, they figured out how to get stuff where other people can't go. This is also true in Somalia because of the clan affinities and relationships that emerge. Certain commercial people can move where other people cannot. So identifying traders, finding out what their barriers are, helping de-risk them by giving them either loan guarantees or other things that help them go and then having the, um, the vouchers on the other side. So in essence, you're tinkering both on the demand side and on the supply side, which can get a little dicey, I think. But uh, we have had some success in South Sudan, and as have other people, in actually building up markets by facilitating trader movement to areas where instead of saying, there's no food here, we have to bring in in-kind aid, it's like, OK, we need in-kind aid for now, but I, if we work with traders, we could probably move this market system back into this area. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, thank you very much. My name is Dixon. I'm a second year IDEF student. Um, you touched about like, um, how you're working with the biggest to assess, to ensure that uh, you strengthen the local system. Um, I wanted to find out um, to what extent are you working with these bakers to ensure that you're not only addressing assets, but also the utilization part of the food security challenge? I wasn't understanding the, the working with whom? The bakers. You said you Oh, the work, bakers. Yes. Uh-huh. That program was accompanied by other actors who were providing canned goods for, for um, and other things directly to households. Uh, and voucher, like we've shifted, I think most actors in Syria have shifted where, where they can to, again, a voucher system where people are, um, if we're working at the household level, are going to the markets to buy the kind of thing that they would cook in their homes and would have a diverse diet. So canned foods, a lot of canned foods, vegetables, that sort of thing, where the bakery was really just focused on that one core piece of the diet, which I know when I was like, well, why, are we, why is, is bread, I mean, we don't think of bread as a healthy food per se, if this is what you're referring to, but just that it is a central part of a meal. So, you know, in Malawi, if people don't eat maize, they'll say they haven't eaten today. In, I understand in Syria, it's the same sort of thing. If we haven't had bread as a central part of our diet, then we're not eating. We're not officially, you know, it's a cultural, um, a social and cultural aspect of, of diet. That's super important. Hi. I have, I have a quick question about sort of switching gears a little bit about how you're incorporating peace building into your efforts and mm -hmm. how, so Mercy Corps, what do you think about, so you're talking about governance with a small g, but mm -hmm. in practice, what kind of programming is that? And yeah. how are you marrying your indicators yeah. in terms of reporting on your food security work with your peace building work, yeah. right? Those are right. very, because, you know, your donors probably right. are still overwhelmingly, I don't know if it's still USG or, uh, and yeah, they're, they're notoriously short term in their um, mm -hmm. progress reports and, and, and what, right. you know, the data that they need you right. to report on. Well, we have had some luck with AID saying you can integrate peace building into this 
resilience program. In other words, in order to achieve food security as the outcome, we want to see food security as the outcome, but we're willing to um, put money into that that will allow us to deal with the conflicts at the community level. A lot of the work on the small g governance side has to do with intercommunal conflict and engaging local civil society and local government actors as we bring communities together to say why what what is the nature of the process the conflict here so if you have new communities overlapping with host communities how can we find mutually agreeable solutions that will um, address the underlying tension so if the community and the local government is saying what we really have here is a water problem can we thanks speaking of water uh, can we have a uh, a conversation around a conflict issue that could be addressed through a water security program or through other kinds of relief activities. So increasingly host communities, for example, vulnerable among them are identified because they don't want, you get a lot of conflict when the vulnerable, host, vulner, the vulnerable communities are saying, why are the refugees getting aid and you're not helping us? We're just as bad off as they are. So it's this blending of peace ap approaches into existing programs. We do have some standalone peace programs, especially in Northeast Nigeria, uh, herder, farmer in the middle belt. We have randomized control trials going on, looking at the ability of peace approaches to reduce conflict. And that, that's pretty interesting, which I can share with you. And we have um, advocacy programs funded by the Europeans. In Maiduguri, these are places in the Northeast saying, what do communities that are, have displaced in them need to um, fare better, to cope and adapt? And helping them prioritize those needs and how to influence their, you know, working through stakeholder mapping, helping them figure out who are their advocates at which part in the, in the chain to affect change at the community level and your outcomes are going to be very variable. Um, so those are just a few examples. If you could speak a bit about the situation in Venezuela and food security and access and also for people fleeing Venezuela. Yeah. I'm not fully averse. I mean, I read what you read. And we have teams in Colombia that are providing cash transfers and uh, assistance to Venezuelans in Colombia, as well as Colombians who are affected. Again, it's this issue of how to reduce tensions, right? So trying to have more of a mixed approach to the response is one of the things that we're doing. We have an assessment going on inside Venezuela. And one of the very interesting things that we're thinking about are blockchain transfers, which is how technology is going to be transforming cash transfer programming, I think, soon enough. Because people are buying, and because there's no, there's no value to the currency anymore, does it really make sense to give anybody money? And you have markets that are some, sometimes empty, sometimes not. What can blockchain do? Some, first of all, it can solve the currency problem, but it doesn't necessarily solve the availability problem. So these are the things we're going to be testing out with some local partners, whether blockchain can um, make a difference as we think about uh, new programming approaches uh, in, in Venezuela. And I think there's some um, access to clean water is obviously a big, a big one as well. And thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I'm, um, I'm Ye Wan. I'm a reporter from Radio Free Asia. Ah. <laughs> and I have a question on the Asia region. Um, in the case of North Korea, almost 11 million people, are, which is 40% of the population, are undernourished. 
and one in five children are stunted due to chronic malnutrition. Um, so, but however, the food, insecur food insecurity problem in North mm -hmm. Korea goes unnoticed in, in the yeah. international community. Mm -hmm. um, I think the political issues like nuclear weapons negotiations dominate the yeah. discussions in North Korea. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you able to share your th overall yeah. thoughts on the dire North Korean humanitarian situation yeah. in terms of food security issues? Well, I can tell you that um, that Food for Peace and Mercy Corps were very involved in the humanitarian response back in the early 2000s, I want to say, for the food crisis in, in North Korea. That was a time when uh, the U.S. government decided that the situation was so bad that, you know, we don't make dis decisions um, on uh, the, the ideal is, of course, that we don't blend our humanitarian aid and our politics, right? Uh, and, in, and at that moment, we, the U.S. government decided to move forward. There are two things that have traditionally inhibited the response in North Korea, as I understand it. I don't have a lot of personal experience with it. One is the ability to independently assess need. The other is the ability to independently monitor the program. And those two things were the downfall of that program in the early 2000s, where the United Nations and the other NGOs that were working on humanitarian aid were not able to meet those two criteria. Those continue to be the criteria, and I imagine will continue to be one of the challenges. Um, there, I'm sure there are many more complex points we could go into, but those are the two that, that come to mind. Hi, my name is Jesse. I'm from USAID. I was wondering if I could ask you something that I'm puzzling through myself, so I don't want to make you do my job for me. Okay. Um, but I've been struggling with how do we, I want to see more peace building and lowercase g work in these mm -hmm. protracted crises. And I think we know, and I love the markets work that Mercy Corps does and, you know, and all the sort of thought leadership you've had in this space in general. Thank you. But I, I struggle with how do we do more peace building and lowercase g governance work in the very spaces where we struggle to get the information we need to know who the local champions are and who those, you know, to have a really mm -hmm. acute local political awareness mm -hmm. of who our change makers and champions are, who might work towards the goals we have, yeah. or will they be the very folks that work against that? And from that conflict sensitivity perspective, right. we're being pulled back in terms of access from the very places where we need such mm -hmm. good information. And so it's a personal struggle of mine because I feel hesitant to advocate for the very things that on the other hand are so tricky to do and we often don't have the right That's a good point. intel. So it is challenging. And I don't know if Mercy Corps has any creative approaches or lessons learned mm -hmm. from especially mm -hmm. your work in Syria, Northeast Nigeria, um, yeah. just in that yeah. general area. So um, one thing that we've done is stand up a humanitarian analysis unit uh, and we have them dedicated by country. So we've got one in North, we have got someone who sits in um, North, in my uh, working with local staff. We'd like to grow that. We have a number of people who work on Libya, Syria, Yemen, and we're putting out real-time information around specific topics to inform humanitarian action. And we're trying to layer new data sets in different ways to see if we can't anticipate, say, where future shocks would be. So in Syria, we were able to project where, which roads would be closed and when in, or, in order to move relief supplies. But I do think something like that, where you have a willing to invest in analytics, which is why it's under the face of this framework here, is that who does that? The humanitarians will say, well, you know, what kind of, just how much, what kind of humanitarian, we don't want to get into politics, you know? So what do you call that? Context analysis, but fundamentally, I think the donors are going to have to accept that some sort of improved anal analytical set of tools and people on the ground doing exactly what you're, you're doing as part of a development or, well, part of a response program without tagging it relief development or peace building, but just as a general response is, is, is one thing. And the second thing is that the, um, the budget for peace building, of course, is negligible, as far as I can tell, at AID. And so even though we don't know a lot about what works, right, we don't have the evidence 
base about what, what, what works and will the donors invest into getting that evidence base? We've done it for resilience, but do we need to figure out a much more aggressive way of thinking about analytics and the impact of peace and governance programs, which is a challenge everywhere. Um, you know, we really struggle with making the case for those because of the, this is why we're doing the randomized control trial in the middle belt in Nigeria to see if we can actually uh, come up with a data set which makes the case. Um, Dina, thank you. For those of a couple of you in the room who don't know me, I'm Cinnamon Dornsife. I'm on the faculty here at SAIS. Um, thank you so much, Dina. I'm going to ask you to go back a couple of slides. You know, maybe everybody can remember um, talking about the shifts um, in food assistance um, and um, food security. What arguments were, um, in your view, most effective in shifting policymakers and members of Congress? Um, viewpoints about traditional, the PL480 right. and food, traditional food assistance programs mm -hmm. into evolving towards more food security. Maybe right. top one or two arguments or cases that you used yeah. that you found to be most persuasive and yeah. impactful. Thank you. Um, I think the reason it was a bipartisan agenda is that there was data to suggest that untying food aid would be more efficient, better value for money and more effective. So we were able to show the cost differential between shipping a ton of food and buying a ton of food locally. We were able to show the amount of time it takes to ship a ton of food versus buy a food uh, locally. And so just from a purely efficiency point of view, uh, Republicans love that agenda. The Heritage Foundation came out as a major advocate of food aid reform. <laughs> Um, you had this weird set of bedfellows uh, in terms of food aid reform. The people who are against it, uh, sometimes there were people in liberal states but who had a big uh, farm lobby. So no, no amount of talking really got us through uh, for ag states. Although some of the ag, if you talk to farmers and even, a lot of farmers are saying, look, we just want to help hungry people. We, we want to contribute if we can, but we don't want you to do, I mean, reasonable people are like, of course, don't do something that doesn't make sense, but if we can help, we'd like to. But there were politics around the ag uh, associations, and then the biggest block was the maritime industry, mm -hmm. because in addition to having to buy American food, it has to go on American flagged vessels. Those are the folks who are absolutely 100% reliant for their livelihoods on this program. And those are the folks who continue to advocate most strongly. There's just no, there's no, there's no doing it. And that's why, you know, we would, could talk till we're blue in the face. We got a little bit of flexibility. That was a nod from the farmers to say, yeah, we get it. You don't always want our food. We get it. We'll, flex, we'll untie a little bit. But fundamentally, it was the foreign affairs committees that just said, look, we're done with this conversation. We know it's the right thing to do. We're going to authorize it, and we're going to appropriate it under the Foreign Affairs Act. Because there was just, you know, only so far the arguments could take us. Thank you. Yeah. No. no other questions? <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. Great. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, if you come to these events regularly, you know my spiel by now. But um, we have a bunch of food in the back, so feel free to take any extra food. Uh, we definitely don't want any food to go to waste. Um, and second of all, I just want to thank Dina, um, Miss Dina Esposito again for coming out here and being able to share about all the wonderful work that Mercy Corps is coming. Is Mercy Corps is doing. Um, they also were kind enough to bring some flyers out. Um, so if you want to know more about Mercy Corps, they are in the back next to the water. Um, so feel free to take some. And thank you so much. And have a great day. Thanks for coming.